The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... visit a museum to look at paintings, some very few of them are referred to as having been painted by old masters. Applying the criteria to detectives, there would be only one who could properly be called the old master. He is, of course, Sherlock Holmes. But how many of you know that Sherlock Holmes once failed, yes, failed, in an assignment, an assignment that involved the fate and history of two European countries. There is no other way, Boris. She must be kidnapped. And then? Forced to tell where she's hidden it. You are speaking of torture? I am speaking of overthrowing a government. Torture, murder, abduction. These are words for the weak. We murdered... Our mystery drama, A Scandal in Bohemia, was adapted from the Sherlock Holmes classic, especially for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Sherlock Holmes looked upon love as a nuisance. An emotion that could only unbalance the beautiful analytic machinery of the mind. Or, as his creator, a conumerable Watson. Immediately after my marriage, I- I'd seen little of Sherlock Holmes. All I knew about my former friend and companion was what I read of his exploits in the daily press. One night in 1888, I was returning from seeing a patient. My way led through Baker Street, and I was seized with a keen desire to see Holmes again. I rang the bell of the well-remembered door, and shortly thereafter was greeted by my friend in the sitting room. Wedlock suits you, Watson. <laughs> I think you've put on seven and a half pounds since I last saw you. <laughs> Five, Joe. Seven. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you've resumed your medical practice. You didn't tell me you were going back into harness. Well, then how did you know it? I see it. I deduce it. How do I know that you've been getting yourself very wet lately and that you've a most clumsy and careless servant girl? My dear Holmes, this is too much. Mm. Had you lived a few centuries ago, you would certainly have been burned at the stake. Well, it's true that I had a country walk on Thursday and came home in a dreadful mess. But as I've changed my clothes, I can't imagine how you did just it. As to our girl Mary Jane, <laughs> she's incorrigible. And my wife has given her notice. But then again, I fail to see how you work it out. It's simplicity itself. My eyes tell me that on the inside of your left shoe, Hmm? just where the firelight strikes it, the leather is scored by six parallel cuts. Now, obviously, they've been caused by someone who has very carelessly scraped around the edges of the sole to remove the crusted mud from it. Oh, George. Hence my double deduction that you've been out in wet weather and that you have a particularly careless servant. <laughs> yes, you know, you always make it sound so simple. But how about my resuming my medical practice? Oh, come, Watson. If a gentleman walks into my room smelling of iodoform with a black mark of nitrate of silver upon his right forefinger and a buzz on the right side of his top hat showing where he secreted his stethoscope, I must be a dull dog indeed if I don't pronounce him an active member of the medical profession. (laughs) Each time you explain your process, it appears that anyone can do it. And I know my eyes are quite as good as yours. Of course. You see, but you do not observe. By the way, you may be interested in this, which came by the last post. Read it. There will call upon you tonight at a quarter to eight o'clock... A gentleman who desires to consult you upon a matter of the very deepest moment. Mm -hmm. Your recent services to one of the royal houses of Europe have shown that you are one who may safely be trusted with matters which are of an importance which can hardly be exaggerated. 
This account of you we have from all quarters received. Be in your chamber then at that hour and do not take it amiss if your visitor wears a mask. Well, this is indeed most mysterious, Holmes. What do you imagine it means? Mm, well, it's a capital mistake to theorize before you have data, but we do have the note itself. What do you deduce from it? Well, the man who wrote it was presumably well-to-do. This paper can't be bought under half a crown a packet. It's peculiarly strong and stiff. Peculiar? That's the very word. Hold it up to the light and tell me what you make of the initials woven into the texture of the paper. Uh, I make out a large E, a small G, a capital P, and a large G... And a small T. No doubt the name of the maker, perhaps his monogram. Not at all. The large G with the small T stands for Gesellschaft, which is German for company. Oh. It's a customary contraction. P, of course, stands for Papier. And now for the E.G., let's take a look at our continental gazetteer. Eglal, Eglonitz, here we are. Egria. It's a German-speaking country in Bohemia. Not far from Carlsbad. Oh. Remarkable as being the scene of the death of Wallenstein and for its numerous glass factories and paper mills. Now, Watson, what do you make of it? Mm, the paper was made in Bohemia. Precisely. And the man who wrote the note is a German. Well, uh, that's only a possibility, Holmes. He could have purchased the paper. No, 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 Watson. Note the peculiar construction of the sentence... This account of you we have from all quarters received. A Frenchman or a Russian could never have written that. Only a German is so uncourteous to his verbs as to place them at the very end of a sentence. It remains, therefore, to discover what is wanted by this German who writes upon bohemian paper and prefers wearing a mask to showing his face. And, if I'm not mistaken, he's arriving now. Holmes pressed me to stay. You know, I remained seated, and Holmes opened the door to admit a man who was at least six foot six, with the limbs and chest of a Hercules. He was dressed so richly as to be considered almost in bad taste. He topped off his rich costume with a black vizard mask, which he'd evidently just adjusted as he entered. He spoke with a German accent, looking from one of us to another as if uncertain which one to address. You had my note. I told you that I would call. Pray take a seat. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson, who is occasionally kind enough to help me with my cases. No. Whom do I have the honor to address? Uh, you may address me as the Count von Kram, a bohemian nobleman. Mm -hmm. I understand that this gentleman, your friend, is a man of honor and discretion whom I may trust with a matter of most extreme importance. <laughs> if not, I must communicate with you alone. It's both or none. You may say before this gentleman anything which you may say to me. And I must begin by binding you both to absolute secrecy for two years. At the end of that time, the matter will be of no importance. At the moment, it is not too much to say that it is of such weight it may have an influence upon European history. I promise. And I... You will excuse this mask. The august person who employs me wishes his agent to be unknown to you. And I confess at once that the title by which I call myself... Is not exactly my own. I was aware of it. Every precaution has to be taken to quench what might grow to be an immense scandal and seriously compromise one of the reigning families. To speak plainly, the matter involves the great house of Ormstein, hereditary kings of Bohemia. I was also aware of that. You surprise me. If your majesty would condescend to state your case, I should be better able to advise you. Oh, you are right. I am the king. 
Why should I attempt to conceal it? Why, indeed? Your Majesty had not spoken four words before I was aware that I was addressing Wilhelm Gottsreich von Ormstein, Grand Duke of Kassel-Felstein and hereditary King of Bohemia. Then you can understand I am not accustomed to doing such business in my own person. Yet the matter is so delicate, I cannot confide in an agent without putting myself in his power. I come incognito from Prague to consult you. Then pray consult. Briefly, these are the facts. Some years ago, during our lengthy visit to Warsaw, I made the acquaintance of a well-known adventuress, Irene Adler. Her name is no doubt familiar to you. Will you be so kind as to look her up in my index, Doctor? Oh, yes, well, gladly, Holmes. <clears throat> well, your index is complete, Holmes, but... Not in the best of order, so I'm glad that her name starts with an A. Here she is. Thank you. Now, let me see. Hmm. Born in New Jersey, 1858. Prima donna, Imperial Opera of Warsaw. Contralto, retired from the stage, living now in London. Uh, quite so. Thank you, Doctor. And now Your Majesty, as I understand, became entangled with this young person, wrote her some compromising letters, and is now anxious to get these letters back. Precisely so. Mm -hmm. But how did you... Was there a secret marriage? Oh, of course not. Legal papers? Certificates? None. Well, then I fail to follow Your Majesty. If this person should produce her letters for blackmail or other purposes, how is she to prove their authenticity? There is the writing. Ooh. Forgery. My private notepaper. Stolen. My own seal. Imitated. My photograph. But we were both in the picture. Oh, dear. That is very bad. Your Majesty has indeed committed an indiscretion. And so, as this story, A Scandal in Bohemia, shows... Holmes was not unknown to royalty, and royalty, despite masks, could not stay unknown to Holmes. We'll be back with the pressing problem of the King of Bohemia and meet Irene Adler, the woman, shortly. Sherlock Holmes in love? Perish the thought. And yet, of all the tales of Sherlock Holmes, as recorded by his friend, Dr. Watson, there's no other adventure in which he expresses as much admiration for a woman as he does for Irene Adler. And keep in mind, she came to his attention not as a client, but as an adversary. But it's best we let Watson continue the story. I was watching His Majesty's face. The moment Holmes said he'd committed a serious indiscretion, his face flashed. I was mad, insane. But remember, I was a young crown prince then. I didn't realize the consequences. Mm, it must be recovered. Don't you think we have tried and failed? Then it must be bought. She will not sell. Stolen then? Five attempts at obtaining the photograph have been made. Twice I had burglars ransack her house. Once we diverted her luggage when she traveled. The luggage was searched thoroughly. Twice she has been waylaid and her purse taken of her has been no result. Mm -hmm. And what does she propose to do with the photograph? Ruin me. How? I am about to be married. My fiancé is the second daughter of the King of Scandinavia. A shadow of a doubt as to my youthful conduct would end the engagement and bring about some very serious side effects as well. And Irene Adler threatens to send the photograph. Uh -huh. And I know she will do as she says. Rather than I should wed another, there are no lengths to which she will not go. None. You're sure she hasn't sent it yet? I am certain. Hmm? On what do you base this certainty? Because she has said that she would send it on the day when the betrothal was publicly proclaimed. That will be next Monday. Then we still have three days. Your Majesty will, of course, stay in London for the present. Oh, certainly. You will find me at the Langham under the name Count von Kram. Mm. 
Watson, would you take down the lady's address when His Majesty gives it to you? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Bryony Lodge, Serpentine Avenue, Pine Avenue, St. John's Wood. Very good. And now, good evening, Your Majesty. I trust that we shall soon have some good news for you. Holmes asked me to come around the next day at three. When I arrived, he wasn't there. He'd run into unexpected complications that I was to hear about when he returned shortly after four. Well, accustomed as I was to my friend's amazing powers and the use of disguises, I had to look more than once to make certain that the drunken-looking, ill-kempt, side-whiskered groom was indeed he. <laughs> Watson, I'm sure you could never guess how I employed my morning or what I ended by doing. Well, I, I, I suppose you've been watching the habits and perhaps the house of Miss Irene Adler. Quite so. I can tell you that we are not the only ones after that photograph. Well, you mean the king has employed others in the same capacity as you? Mm, I think not. But let me give you a picture of the day's happenings. Uh. I left the house a little after eight this morning, disguised as a groom seeking work. Irene Adler has turned all the men's heads around Bryony Lane. After giving a few of the ostlers a hand in rubbing down their horses, I came upon a character who seemed equally interested in the topic of Miss Irene Adler as I. We fell into a conversation as he bought me a glass of half-and-half half in a neighboring pub. Here's to the ladies, God bless them. And to Miss Irene Adler in particular. <laughs> May they all be as beautiful as she and as rich. She's well off, then. No, you seem like the kind of person of broken trust. Are you trustworthy, mate? Uh, it all depends. There might be a lot of reasons for you to be trustworthy if you don't mind taking a few risks. It all depends on what kind of risks you're talking about. Oh, nothing very big. Just helping out a little with the job we have in mind. Hmm? Who's we? I don't like working blind. I have to know what kind of job you're talking about. Well, <laughs> You might say it was a kind of a lark. With a lady who lives at Bryony Lodge? Uh, you're a sharp one, you are. That's the very one. Just a bit of a lark, that's all. The reason I picked you, mate, was because you have an honest face and uh, showed a lot of interest in the lady yourself. You see, I was listening to you, mate. I thought it might be a good burst for me. What I have in mind might pay you a lot better. Huh? How much are we talking about? Fifty pounds. Fifty? You didn't think I had an honest vice. You thought I had a stupid vice. Now let me tell you, mate, I don't go for the rough stuff so you can forget about me right now. The fifty ain't all for you. I need four or five boys who don't mind creating a bit of a dust-up around Bryony Lodge. And I need them tomorrow. Mm, good luck. I ain't going to be one of them. I was thinking you'd get them for me. You look like a fellow who might know some chaps who don't mind a bit of fun and... You keep on about a bit of fun. Yes, you keep on and on about that. And your idea of fun and mine might not be the same, if you know what I mean. Well, you heard what all the grooms were saying about Mademoiselle's boyfriend, the one who visits her so frequent. Aye. Well, his best friend wants to play a little joke, you see. <laughs> sort of stage a kidnapping. Not a real one, of course, but... Me and my partner will spirit her away, and then her boyfriend's pal sort of says, April Fool, <laughs> and the joke's over. Don't sound very funny to me. A uh, real gent's idea of fun is different than you and me. Well, mate, what do you say? By Jove, Holmes, this fellow sounds a proper villain. What did you say? Accepted his offer, of course. And got myself 25 pounds in advance. But, Holmes, you can't possibly be contemplating doing what this fellow asks. Surely you must see that he, he, he he's not joking, that, that he means to abduct Miss Adler. Of course, but you haven't allowed me to finish my day's adventures. 
The last part caps it all. After striking the bargain with this scoundrel, I set off on my own to take a closer look at Bryony Lodge and see how I could best turn these events to our advantage when a handsome cab clattered up to the lady's door and a dark, handsome gentleman jumped out. Wait for me, driver. I won't be a moment. He was as good as his word. A few minutes later, he came down the steps, ran down, jumped into the cab, and shouted, Drive like the devil. First the Gross and Hankies in Regent Street, and then to the Church of St. Monica in Edgware Road. Half a guinea if you do it in 20 minutes. He and his hansom were hardly out of sight before a neat little landau drew up before the house, and I had my first glimpse of Miss Irene Adler as she rushed from the house. The church is in Monica, John, and half a sovereign if you can reach it in 20 minutes. This was quite too good to lose, so while I was debating whether or not to make a run for it, and perched behind her landau, a cab came down the street. Before the driver could object to my shabby appearance, I jumped in showed him a coin, and, parrot-like said, the Church of St. Monica, and half a sovereign if you make it in 20 minutes. But this is absurd, Jeff. You're naughty not to have thought of it. Everything was being done in such a rush, darling. I, I never thought about a witness. Uh, well, here, this nice-looking gentleman, he'll do. Oh, thank heaven. Thank the Lord. Uh, come on, man. What? What do you want? A witness. A witness to our marriage. And we not only thank you, but we thank St. Monica. (laughs) It was the most preposterous position I've ever found myself in my life. The bride gave me a sovereign, and I mean the word, on my watch chain in memory of the occasion. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> but, but doesn't this sudden marriage threaten everything? It certainly seemed to menace our plan seriously. However, when they separated at the church door, I heard her tell him that she would drive out in the park at five as usual. So then I went off and made my own arrangements for tonight. Which are? To be revealed to you after some cold beef and a glass of beer to fortify ourselves for this evening's work. I don't like it, Ferenc. It's dangerous. Boris, it's our only alternative. To rely on this half-drunken groom you meet in a bar? I've already explained to you he was interested in Bryony Lodge and Miss Adler. Can we trust him? Of course not. But we can rely on his greed. You didn't see the way he snatched the 25 pounds advance. I still do not like it. Oh, I grant it's not ideal, but there's very little risk. Once we have the lady and the carriage, we drive off. What can he tell the police? Everything. Which is little enough. He doesn't even know my name. He's never seen you. In half an hour, we'll be safely hidden. And I promise you'll have the location of the photograph out of her before the search has had time to get organized. Ah... Now that the inner man's been satisfied, Watson, let's set our plans. I shall need your cooperation. No, I, I, I shall be delighted. Now, Miss Adler always returns from her drive in the park at seven. We must be on hand to meet her. I've already engaged the services of several stout lads who will create the uproar that I promised my companion in the pub. What, you're not going to throw in with those villains after all? Oh, only to the extent of creating a disturbance, which I intend to put to our advantage, of course. My lads are instructed to see that on no account will the lady be taken. But uh, won't the other people know that? In the confusion, they'll only know that their plans have gone awry. Huh. Have you any idea who they are or what they want with the photograph? Uh, only that they've definitely not been hired by His Majesty. As to the rest, I can hazard a guess or two. Either they want the photograph to extort a pretty penny from His Majesty or from some political purpose. In either case, it doesn't matter. What is important is your role. Oh, well, I'm, I'm impatient to hear it. There will be some unpleasantness, but on no account are you to interfere... I promise you it will all end with my being conveyed into the lady's sitting room. Four or five minutes afterwards, the sitting room window will open. You are to station yourself close to that window. Hmm. Is that all? No, by no means. Now, I have here an ordinary plumber's smoke rocket fitted with a self-igniting cap at either end. You will throw this through the open window into the room at the same time raising a good loud cry of fire. Understood? 
Uh, Yes, but... I I, I haven't finished, sorry. Your cry will then be taken up by a considerable number of people in the street. Then your part is finished. Walk to the end of the street where I will rejoin you in ten minutes. Claire? Uh, Well, for the life of me, I I can't see how you know you'll be taken into the room and and, and the window open. Yeah, the explanation will have to wait because now I, I must change for my new role. To my astonishment, when Holmes came out from his chamber, he was dressed as an elderly clergyman. And once again, I thought, what a fine actor the stage had lost when he elected to become a consulting detective. We shortly afterwards were pacing up and down outside Irene Adler's house in St. John's Wood. Ah, I see that my lads are all in position. And so are you, Watson, because here we are outside the sitting room window. And you promised to explain to me how you're going to get yourself inside and have the window open. All in good time. But the key question remains, where do we find the photograph? (laughs) Probably at her bank or her attorney's. I think neither. It's much too precious for her to have it out of her possession. It's in the house. But it's been burgled twice. Sure, they didn't know how to look. Well, how will you look? I'll get her to show me. Oh, ridiculous. She's bound to refuse. She won't be able to. (laughs) Incredible. It will all be clear to you, but we have no more time. It's almost the hour. I think I see her carriage in the distance. Now, carry out my order to the letter. John's Wood has always been an exclusive, quiet, residential section of London. But in a very few minutes, that quiet is to be shattered by some shocking incidents, masterminded by Sherlock Holmes. We'll share with Watson an understanding of Holmes' scheme when I return with Act Three. At the very beginning of this story, I spoke of the possibility of Sherlock Holmes being in love. You may wonder how anyone could fall in love with a woman whom he's seen only once, and then at her hurried wedding. But there's more to come. And if I may borrow from the master, all in good time. Now let's rejoin Sherlock Holmes and Watson. Holmes, artfully disguised as an elderly clergyman, and I strolled up and down in front of Irene Adler's house in St. John's Wood. Holmes called my attention to the unusually large amount of activity in the street. I reminded him that he told me they were mostly his men. Not all, Watson. See that scissors grinder over there? Yes. That's the rogue who hired me in the pub. Ah, I see him looking around trying to find me. I am sure he also has an accomplice or two among these passers-by, but the lady will be safe. I certainly hope so. Now, it may appear that some of my blood will be spilled, but rest assured, my dear fellow, that things aren't always what they seem. There. There's the lovely Irene Adler's carriage now. I'm off. Remember my instructions. The carriage had hardly come to a stop before I saw the scissors grinder spring forward and snatch the handle to open the door. At the same time, the loungers went into action and Irene Adler's carriage was surrounded by a score of yelling, cursing men. Boris! Boris! Help me! These fools won't let me through! Stand back! I want to assist the lady! I saw Holmes stride into the crowd, which seemed to make way for him, as he cried out, You rogues! Villains! How dare you assault a lady! Then, suddenly, I saw him clap a hand on his nose, and he was down, with a blood stream coming from his nose. When he fell, I heard a policeman's whistle. 
and a number of the loafers took to their heels. Irene Adler had hurried up the steps, but then stood at the top. Looking back into the street, she called out... That gentleman, sir? He needs help. Well, he can't lie here in the street. Uh, uh, bring him in. There's a comfortable sofa in my sitting room. We'll get a doctor. Slowly and solemnly... Holmes was carried into Bryony Lodge and placed carefully on the sofa. The lamps had been lit, but the blinds hadn't been drawn, so I could see him as he lay on the couch. This truly, wondrously beautiful woman bending tenderly over him. After a moment or two, I saw him raise himself with some difficulty, and they began talking. He later told me how the conversation went. I don't think you should sit up. I'm quite all right, dear lady. I'm more concerned about you. Oh, thanks to your bravery, oh. I just had an unpleasant moment. Oh. Oh. What is it? What is mm. it? <laughs> Nothing to be alarmed about, I'm sure, but if I could have some air... Oh, of course. Marie, mm. open the windows. As the maid opened the window, I saw Holmes raise his hand. The moment her back was turned, I tossed the rocket into the room and shouted, Fire! The cry was instantly taken up as thick clouds of smoke curled through the room and out the window. I slipped through the crowd and made my way to the end of the street and waited. In ten minutes, I was rejoiced to find my friend's arm in mine, and we walked swiftly away from the scene. You did it very nicely, Doctor. <laughs> Everything's right as rain. <laughs> You have the photograph? I know where it is. Oh, how did you find out? As I told you, she showed me. Well, I'm still in the dark. When a woman thinks her house is on fire, her instinct is at once to rush to the thing she values most. Our lady today had nothing more precious to her than the photograph that we seek. When the alarm of fire was raised, she rushed to secure it. Uh, and she did? The photograph is in a recess behind a sliding panel just above the right bell pole. She was there in an instant, and I caught just a glimpse of it as she half drew it out. Yes, and, and, and now? We've almost reached our goal, and yet uh, there's something gnawing at the back of my mind. Let me repeat the conversation that took place between us after it was discovered that the fire was only a false alarm. It may perhaps suggest something to you. My dear Reverend... Forsyth, madam. Madam? Oh, mm. How very observant of you to notice my wedding ring. It's so new to me that madam quite startled me. I apologize. I should certainly be unable to bear the thought of bringing you any further excitement or trouble. Oh, it has been a hectic five or ten minutes, Reverend. And I must thank you for your courage in coming to my aid. At your age, it might have been dangerous. It was only a Christian act, providential, that I happened to be passing. Heaven does seem to be looking after me and my belongings lately. Heaven looks after us all, dear lady. <laughs> Providence does seem to be taking a special interest in me. Only yesterday, when it appeared that my marriage might have to be put off because my future husband and I needed a witness there quite providentially appeared a somewhat tipsy groom who served as a witness for us. And now, today, I'm almost set upon by a band of toughs, and the Lord sends me an elderly but foolhardy minister who risks his life and limb for a strange lady. It does seem that you're blessed. And now, when for a moment it appeared that my house, with all its lovely furnishings, would be ravaged by fire, I am again saved. When it proves to be a false alarm. <laughs> you may indeed consider yourself fortunate. But if you don't mind, I I feel quite recovered. Oh, yes, of course. I'll have my coachman take you wherever you were going. Oh, I wouldn't think of it, dear madam. You've done quite enough for me as it is. I felt that it was wise to leave as quickly and with as little fuss as possible. And so I met with you. Well, well then why this unease? From what you told me, you accomplished everything you set out to do. I did. And yet. Oh, hang it, man. It's just that there was something in her eyes. Oh, come now, Holmes. Don't tell me that you're mooning over a woman. Not at all, not at all. You misunderstand. 
But uh, here we are in crowded Baker Street. Do you have the key? Yes. Ah, of course not, dear me. I fear I'm getting somewhat absent-minded. Ah, here's the key. It slipped a little during all my exertions. Good night, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Who was that? Oh, search me. Some young lad in an Ulster. He's just now hurrying off. I swear I've heard that voice before. I wonder who the deuce it could have been. Holmes took the puzzle of the voice to bed with him. He also invited me to spend the night because we were to be up so early the next morning. Now, after sending a message off to my wife, I went to bed, and next morning around seven, we were engaged upon our toast and coffee when I inquired of Holmes the reason for our early rising. We're up at this hour, Watson, because the king shall be here shortly. His majesty. I thought it might give him some satisfaction to regain the photograph with his own hands. Oh, well, that still doesn't answer... The lady will probably not be up when we call. We shall be shown into the sitting room, and when she comes down, she may find neither us nor the photograph. You have really got it. Hmm? Not yet. But you have hopes. I have hopes. Ah, then come. I am more impatient to be gone. Ah, we must have a cab. No, my brougham is waiting. Ah, that simplifies matters. Come along, Watson. The game is truly afoot. In no time at all, we found ourselves in the king's carriage, spinning along toward Bryony Lodge and Irene Adler. Irene Adler is married, Your Majesty. Married? Mm. When? Yesterday. But to whom? To an English lawyer named Norton. Impossible. I was a witness to the wedding. Oh, that is not what I meant. Uh, she could not love him. I'm in hopes that she does. And why in because hopes? Because it would spare Your Majesty all fear of future annoyance. If the lady loves her husband, she does not love Your Majesty. If she does not love Your Majesty, there is no reason why she should interfere with Your Majesty's nuptial plans. Uh, well, what you say is true. And yet... Uh, you still have doubts. Oh, not about the truth of what you said. It, uh, it is just that I wish she had been of my own station. What a queen she would have made. <laughs> After that statement, the king relapsed into a somewhat moody silence. When we drew up in front of Bryony Lodge, the door was open and Marie, the maid, stood upon the steps. She watched us with a curious expression as we stepped from the brougham and approached the door. You are Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I am Mr. Holmes. My mistress said you would, uh, how you say, come to call. She did? Well... Is... Well, she left this morning with her husband by the 5.15 train from Charing Cross. She goes to Paris and then for a continental tour. You mean to tell me that she has left the country? Oui. Never to return. The photograph. All is lost. We shall see. Come, quickly. The three of us rushed past the demure maid and Holmes led us to the bell pole, tore back the small sliding panel and pulled out a photograph and a letter. The photograph was of Irene Adler, herself, in the evening dress. The letter was inscribed to Sherlock Holmes, Esquire, to be left till called for. My friend tore it open. It was dated at midnight of the preceding night. We all three crowded around together to read it. I swear that as we started, we could hear her voice. At least from the expression on Holmes's and His Majesty's faces, they could... My dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, you really did it very well. You took me in completely. Until after the alarm of fire, I hadn't a suspicion. But then, thinking how I had betrayed myself, I began to reflect. I had been warned about you months ago. I had been told that if the king employed an agent, it would certainly be you. <laughs> Your address had been given to me. Yet with all this... You made me reveal what you wanted to know. Even after I became suspicious, I found it hard to think evil of such a dear, kind, old clergyman. But, as you know, I have been trained as an actress myself. Male costume is nothing new to me. 
I often take advantage of the freedom it gives. I sent my coachman to watch you. I ran upstairs, got into what I call my walking clothes, and followed you. When I came to your door, I was convinced that I was really an object of interest to the celebrated Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Then I rather imprudently wished you good night and started for the temple to meet my husband. We agreed that our best resource was flight when pursued by so formidable an antagonist. So you will find the nest empty when you call. As to the photograph, your client may ease his mind. I love and am loved by a man better than he. The king may do what he will without hindrance from one whom he has cruelly wronged. I keep it only to safeguard myself. I leave a photograph which he might care to possess. And I remain, dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, very truly yours, Irene Norton, nay, Adler. <sighs> what a woman. Oh, what a woman. Did I not tell you how quick and resolute she was? Mm. I am sorry that I have been unable to bring this business to a successful conclusion. Oh, on the contrary, I know that her word is inviolate. The photograph is now as safe as if it were in the fire. You will uh, please tell me how I may reward you. Oh, this uh, ring I take from my finger, I should be happy to. Your Majesty has something which I should value even more highly. Name it. This photograph. Irene's photograph? Yes. Ah. It is yours. Take it if you wish. Then I thank your majesty and wish you a very good morning. It is, of course, history that the photograph remained always on Holmes' mantle. As far as his actually having been in love with Irene Adler, that is something which is debatable. I'll be back to give you my reasons for thinking it highly likely in just a moment. for thinking that it was more than likely that Holmes did lose his heart to the lovely Irene Adler can be found in the future works of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Prior to his writing A Scandal in Bohemia, he always had Holmes make merry over the cleverness of women. But from that story on, Holmes never again mocked the abilities of the fair sex. we know that whenever he referred to Irene Adler, he always gave her the honored title of The Woman. Our cast included Kevin McCarthy, Court Benson, Marion Seldes, and William Griffiths. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.